Welcome everyone. Welcome to The Crowned Life. And today we're going to talk about why you're still single. <laughs> um, you know, if you're like me, you've been single for quite a while and people start wondering, you know, especially if you are somebody who um, others think is quite the catch yet you, you know, you remain single. Uh, people are like, okay, what's going on here? Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to make this video because I, well, I know a lot of my viewers are dealing with this issue, number one. Number two, I see a lot of people on YouTube trying to answer this question a real snappy, quick, succinct way. And I don't think it's that simple. There are many reasons why you, are single for better or worse, right? There's some positive and negative reasons, which we're gonna get into, um, you know, and they have to do with you. They have to do with you. But, um, you know, before we get into all of that, I wanna talk about the obvious. I wanna talk about things that are outside of you, okay? And there's gonna, there are people online who are like, oh, that doesn't matter. You know, stop blaming, stop using excuses and this type of thing. Well, it's real, okay? It's a reality. I'm not going to put it all on you because, yeah, there are other people involved and we can't control other people. Um, so let's knock this out of the, you know, way first off, right out the bat. You know, let's talk about the obvious, the current dating scene, which may play a very large role in why you're single right now, okay? Um, yeah, it's a challenge. I'm not going to lie to you, but I mean, it's not impossible. So on one hand, I mean, I agree with, um, you know, what some of the people are saying, like, yeah, there's problems, but you know, you can find somebody that you can, uh, have a, a healthy relationship with. It's just, well, it's a little bit harder when you've got a dating scene like we have, and, um, yeah, not impossible, but definitely challenging. And so, um, that makes looking for Mr. or Miss Wright, uh, you know, like looking for a needle in a haystack. Excuse my dog. He's decided to drink a river now that I'm filming. <laughs> he was so asleep right before, you know, as I was setting up and now we've got to drink a river. So, um, my apologies, but I want to say, yeah, on on the subject of the dating scene, I recall um, before I got divorced, I had a friend who warned me about the dating scene. And he said, you know, and he didn't know the full details of my marriage. He was like, don't get a divorce. Just stay married. It's awful. And, you know, let me give him a little pet there. <laughs> and he said... He, he had confessed to me that uh, the year following his divorce, he would, had slept with numerous, numerous women. And he told me it was a mistake. None of them were worth sleeping with. And he just should have stayed married, is what he told me. <laughs> and so, yeah, he said, you're just better off staying married. But like I said, he didn't know the full details of my divorce and or of my marriage. And so I did end up getting a divorce and, you know, now five years later, I can attest to the fact that, yeah, he was right on that point. Um, the dating scene is horrendous. Um, that's painfully true. However, it was right for me to get a divorce, maybe not for him, but definitely for me. So I'm going to talk about what's going on, you know, in the world of modern dating from a woman's perspective first. And then we're going to talk about, yeah, let's, let's work from an external viewpoint of this and work to an internal viewpoint of, okay, what do we do with this? Right out the gate, let me say with the dating scene from a woman's perspective, there are a lot of recycled narcs out there. I had a client who actually told me she called it that and I thought, man, that was so spot on. They just, they go from relationship to relationship looking for supply. They're looking for somebody to feed their ego. You know, give me attention, give me admiration, make me feel good, make me happy. And then the moment you fail to do that because, um, you know, you, you want something in return or you're looking to deepen the love or the commitment or the whatever, then boom, they're out, they're on to the next supply source that's going to feed their ego. And... 
Um, these are people who put little or no effort, um, little or no investment, and they want all the benefits of a relationship, zero the risk, zero the cost. I remember um, Matthew Hussey, who's like a dating uh, relationship coach here on YouTube, he called them, uh, these kind of men, Mr. Minimal Effort. Um, MPI, there's a funny video out. If you get a chance to watch it, check it out. It's on Matthew Hussey's channel, really funny. Um, but, you know, I just call them betcha gibby jibbies. That's what I call them, okay? And so, and some of them are just, they're looking for a mommy. They want somebody to take care of them, make them feel good, um, tell them they did a great job, even when they didn't, and, you know, so we're, we're dealing with a lot of a lot of that, okay? Whether they're outright narcissists or they're just people who are demonstrating narcissistic character traits, okay? Because I mean, I think statistically it's been found most people are not narcissistic, but we do have a lot of people who uh, demonstrate a lot of those traits. And I think you see that a lot, particularly in the uh, dating arena and why not because think about it i mean if you are a healthy person and you know you have a high eq emotional quotient why wouldn't you be in a healthy relationship i know it sounds hypocritical because it looks back at me like okay what's your problem we'll get to that <laughs> all right so um there's another issue with um mm, fake alphas and beta males. So yeah, maybe these men are not um, narcissistic and looking for supply necessarily, okay? But um, they're character impaired and they're unable to lead and they're just too insecure within themselves. That brings us to number three. We have uh, men who are if they're not if they're not fake alphas or betas which by the way I talk about in one of my videos um, if you haven't seen it it's titled what women want I'll have the link at the very end um, but yeah if they're if they're not fake alphas and betas if they're not you know recycled narcs then we're dealing with a lot of wounded males who um, are unhealed and you see these men kind of part of the MGTOW movement, men going their own way. And um, this is especially hard on women like myself who are single moms because the, the men in that movement, I mean, they will avoid you like the plague the moment they find out that you have children. As a matter of fact, I will tell you when I meet men and they come up and start talking to me, um, you know, I'm gonna give you one of my little tricks for avoiding time wasters here. Um, I meet men, they come up, they talk to me, they're all smiles, they're happy, they're flirty, and we're chatting and everything's going casual. And then, oh, probably within the first five to 10 minutes that we're talking, I may just casually, in passing, mention something about, well, one of my daughters or my kids or something like that. And I just, it's, it's not to make the conversation about my kids, it's just to, you know, oh, by the way, my daughter, uh, something like that. Oh, I'm doing something with my daughter this weekend, or, you know, uh, my kids made this for me or something like that. Okay. And then what I do is I just sit back and I look at the expression on their face and I look at what they do. Okay. I mean, I keep talking to them, but I'm observant. I'm observant. And I will tell you nine and a half times out of 10, boom, they're out they're out. They've got to take a phone call. Oh, oops, they forgot something. Oh, I've got to go. And they don't come back. And I know exactly what that means. Um, and that means you have baggage and I don't want to share in it. And so, um, yeah, it's really rough on, on women like myself who have children and, um, there are a lot of men who just don't want any part of that. And so um, now, by the way, we have the wig towel movement, women going their own way. So if you're a man watching this, you're like, well, what about the men women? Yeah, there's women who are kind of doing a backlash now against mid towel with wig towel. And they're just giving up on men altogether because they've got this attitude like, well, why? If you're just gonna stay at home in your mom's basement, play video games and get off on porn, I mean, why do I need that? I don't, you know? 
And so it's pretty sad we're dealing with a sexodus. Uh, some people are choosing to be single uh, because of this woundedness and unhealed state in their own their own energy. And um, by the way, if you're a woman who's been dealing with wounded femininity, I recently put out a video about that as well. So might yeah put the the link for that video at the very end if you're interested. Okay. So anyway, in a nutshell, it's rough. I think many of you already know it. If you've been single, you know um, that there are very real challenges in the dating arena. And so now that we've addressed that, other people's issues aside, let's talk about yours, mine, right? I'm gonna do some sharing with you and hopefully that helps for you to relate to yourself um, what the issues might be for better or worse, right? Positive or negative. Why is it that you're still single? Because not everybody's dysfunctional like that, right? <laughs> okay, so there are about four reasons I've identified on the positive as to why you could be single very quickly. And then I'll go in a little bit deeper, but number one, you're refusing to settle. Number two, it's a divinely appointed time in your life. Number three, you've decided to work on personal development. Number four, you have decided to conserve your sexual energy and transmute it onto something else that you feel is gonna bring you more positive returns at this time in your life. So going a little bit deeper into that, let me say on the issue of refusing to settle, you know that Loneliness can happen to anybody. You could be in a marriage and feel entirely alone and you are not gonna settle on that saying, oh, well, I've got the ring or I've got the piece of paper, but I'm alone and I'm trapped in this marriage or with this person who doesn't love me and it's loveless. So you're, you're not gonna settle on that at all. You're not gonna settle on less than your worth and you are refusing um, to have a relationship of convenience. It's principles really that are at the heart of it. And so also it could be that, you know, you're trying to make space for the right person by getting um, rid of relationships that come with expiration dates. I mean, I did this. I've had a couple men in my life and one in particular, you know, things were great, but I mean, he made it very clear that nothing was ever going to become of it. And I believed him. I absolutely believed him and understood his reasoning and all that, but rather than try to convince him and win him over, I just honored it. And I said, you know, I'm sorry, but I can't really be who I am in this relationship, not fully. And I, I'm going to have to like release you and let you go, you know, as much as I hate to do that, because, you know, the longer I get involved with you, the more feelings I'm going to develop. And you've already told me this is going nowhere. So, um, I need to make space for somebody where it can go somewhere. You know, this can develop into a life partnership, uh, rather than, you know, something that's just, um, casual. Um, because the longer it remains casual, the more I'm going to feel like I'm investing in something that has no return on investment, you know, and yeah, then you're not, you're not seeing other possibilities there, or you're not available for other possibilities because you're wrapped up into a bad investment. You know what I'm saying? So for this reason, you're just like, okay, I can see the right on the wall. This, this relationship has an obvious expiration date. So I'm gonna cut my losses sooner than later so that I can make myself emotionally and physically available for the person who actually wants to build a life with me. Because this person has clearly said in word and deed, they don't. So another reason, um, number two, divinely appointed, there's just a time and a season for this, right? There's a time and a season in your life where maybe you need to clear your energy, you need to, um, get clear within yourself um, about who you are, maybe even to feel what's missing so that you get clearer about what you know you value. And, you know, this might also not just have to do with you, but it might have to do with family members, particularly if you're somebody like myself who was married for many years, 20 years, <laughs> and then, you know, had three kids and 
um, after the divorce, I don't think people really knew who I was apart from that person. Um, there were life issues and circumstances that occurred during those 20 years. They were not able to sort out who was doing what. They just, it was all jumbled. Like they associated me with certain things and they didn't understand that I wasn't starting that. I wasn't doing that. I was dealing with that, but it wasn't my own doing, you know? because I had been involved in a relationship that was very toxic, they associated me with toxicity, you know, and it wasn't until I got really had some time to just stand on my own without that person or anybody else that they were able to see me clearly for who I was like, oh, wait a minute, we can trust you. Uh, you are dependable. You do go to work. You do make sacrifices. You do keep your word. Hold on a second. We didn't know this side of you because there was sabotage going on for 20 years in my life and they couldn't see that. They couldn't see who I was. And so there was a lot of healing that happened in relationships simply because of this time and season of life where I was alone. Now, another reason, reason number three is personal development. And it could be that you are learning how to be on your own and just face that fear of loneliness, especially if you are somebody who uh, comes from um, a codependent past, you know, codependent programming where you're very other focused and other referential. And, you know, spirit is just kind of like, uh, no, we need to figure out, you, you, you need to get more balanced. You know, it's good to consider other people, but not at the detriment of yourself. And so, you know, you're at a time in your life now where you're learning about you and your needs and your values and getting confidence also in your own relational competence. Maybe you're learning more about relationships and you're becoming less afraid of walking away from toxic people. This is what happens when you don't conquer, conquer the fear of loneliness. You stay with toxic people and toxic relationships. You tolerate things you shouldn't because you are afraid, well, I'm not gonna have anybody or I'm not gonna be supported and how am I gonna make it on my own? But um, when you face that demon down and you overcome that fear, you get to a place where you're confident. Like, you know what, if I find out something about this person, um, this next Mr. or Mrs. Next, and I realize, wait a second, this is not gonna work. I'm going to be okay with saying no and walking away. I know I'm gonna make it. It might not be easy, but damn it, I'm, I'm going to be able to do it because some of you, some of you have really been through some rough stuff. You've lived in shelters. You've had to live out of your car. You've had to live out of hotel rooms. Um, but by God, you did it. And uh, it was a very, very bitter pill for you to swallow but having faced those dark days, never again will you allow somebody to trap you in with this fear of, oh my God, you know, what if I can't make it on my own or what's going to happen? I mean, nobody's going to support me leaving this person. Um, how am I financially going to do it? Well, you know now because you've seen the darkest of days, you face it down and you know you're going to be able to. Never again will anybody abuse you like that because you use this time for personal development and developing confidence in your relational competence. Finally, you are conserving your sexual energy. This could be another reason why, you know, you realize that your sexual energy is not to be wasted on just anybody. Um, you know, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I haven't slept with a whole lot of people, but I've slept with enough to know that most of them ain't worth sleeping with, okay? And I'm telling you, like, you know, big sister or, you know, your aunt, whatever, you know, friendly label you want to put on me, especially for the younger ones, um, most people are not worth sleeping with, okay? I, I'm just, they're not worth your energy because when you do that, at least for me, I know there are people out there that do not get emotionally connected, but a lot of women do. 
a lot of women do, and I particularly do, um, because women have a tendency to see sex, not just physically, as a lot of men do. Again, there are exceptions in that camp, but women tend to see sex as something that is emotional, physical, and spiritual. So you don't wanna get your soul tied into that and your emotions tied into somebody who only looks at that union in a physical way and worse, they're not really um, they're not really having sex for um, any kind of high-minded reasons. All right, like um, healing. Okay, um, their reasons are very carnal, very just primal base level of I want to get off. I've got an itch that I need to scratch. Okay, that's the only reason they're trying to have sex with you, and then, you know, you get in bed with them and you find out they're actually awful because it's all about them. Like, you know, it's like it's supposed to be a porn movie for them and they're really not good at it. Um, or they might be, but they're just, they, there's no emotion to it. And without the emotion and the spiritual connection, there's an emptiness to the sex. And unfortunately, I got to say a lot of people bring the emotional and spiritual emptiness to sex because they have not evolved to having sex at a higher, more conscious level. I've got videos on about that too. Well, I got blog about that too, but anyway, I digress. So um, what you might have decided to do as I did for a time, probably over the last two years, is that rather than expend that se sexual energy on somebody who is not on level with you and has no interest in being on level with you um, spiritually and emotionally. Uh, they just want, you know, to use you like a sex toy. Um, well, protect that energy, guard it, and um, transmute it by, you know, using the creative passion and energy, channeling it into more empowering uh, possibilities. And by the way, this is not an old idea. This um, a new idea. This is an old idea. Um, I first read about it, gosh, probably about 20 years ago. And it's in the, the classic book, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. He doesn't talk about it to the very end of the book, but he talks about how people who are wealthy do this. They um, transmute that sexual energy into business ideas and you know, projects and, you know, being launched. And so, you know, over the last couple of years, what I've been doing is channeling that energy into um, a lot of creativity that people have seen with me. You know, I wrote a book and I put it on four different platforms and um, it's not here right now. I'll flash it up on the screen. But I wrote a book and put it on four different platforms and um, Amazon, uh, you know, Kindle, Amazon Print, Amazon Audible, okay. And then I, you know, I launched a blog and I um, opened up different social media profiles. I mean, I, I could go on down the list. I did all this, you know, creative stuff because I was channeling the sexual energy in that way rather than putting it into somebody who's just, you know, like I said, not gonna give me a good return on investment. All right, so those are the positive re reasons. Let's get into the negative reasons. So I'm gonna to talk to you about four negative reasons as to why you're single. And I think, I gotta say this, there's a time and a place for everything. So kind of weigh this out, um, where you stand on this. Are, are you in a dark zone or is this temporary and you're moving out of it, okay? Um, and I'm not shaming anybody for being in these situations. I've been in these situations. And like I said, there's a time and a season for everything. But here they are. Um, four reasons. Number one, intimacy problems. Number two, you are in a marriage. You're in a marriage with yourself. Ego, right? Um, number three, subconscious programming. The way you were raised to think about yourself. It's maybe negative. And then four, could be internal vows or um, karma, okay? So on the subject of intimacy problems, I think, you know, fear is a major stumbling block 
to intimacy and it could be that you're at a place where like I just don't know how to love anymore I don't even know how to be loved anymore and yeah that's probably because of past relationships and baggage that still you're struggling with and it's really in the way of you being able to establish and maintain an intimate connection with another and again you know Maybe you do need to sit with that. Again, you know, for a time in a season, you need to sit with it, especially if you've been in a narcissistic relationship and you've been gaslit a lot. Um, you have dealt with all kinds of really emotionally um, abusive type of, of individuals or behaviors. Even if they weren't narcissistic, they were demonstrating um, narcissistic character traits um, very hard. Okay. And so, um, I would say to sum it up a lot of zero sum games. Okay. People who believe that if you have to lose in order for them to win, they're okay with it. And that can be mind blowing, especially if you are an empath or you have struggled with codependency. Uh, you can't wrap your head around why, why do you, you love these people to the end of the ends of the earth and then they do you like that you just you're stuck like no compute <laughs> you know and my book by the way can help with that if you know if you are interested but um i think you are probably if this if what i'm saying here relates to you well you have maybe come to a point of realization that you do need deeper love than this but you don't yet know how to get that and you do need time to heal and, and get that relational competence that I was talking about of knowing that, you know what, I can trust myself to go out there and try to date again and know that I'm not going to allow myself to get caught up in this dynamic again because I know what to look for and I know how to set and maintain healthy boundaries and I'm going to do it. So I don't need to be afraid. I, um, I can go out there and I can be my own best advocate to make sure this doesn't happen again. The second reason you're in a marriage, a me marriage, a marriage with yourself basically, and I've done this for a while where you just didn't prioritize sharing your life with another person, okay? And it does sound very egocentric. And again, you know, if you just spent the last 20 years making somebody else your focus, maybe you do need to be in a me marriage with yourself, okay? But it can get into a dark zone where we're talking about somebody who's very egocentric and I'm talking about, you know, this doesn't go on for a year. This goes on for years, decades, where this is just part of their MO, modus operandi, where they've got a preoccupation with self-concern. Self-concern is their priority. So, I mean, again, where are you at in this? Um, is this part of you growing or is this part of you being ingrown? I think that's really the question of how you discern where to draw the line on that. Um, if you're growing, then you're eventually going to outgrow this stage. You're not going to do this for years and decades on end, okay? But until you outgrow this stage, you're going to deal with this possibly a fear of losing yourself in union with another. And I would say probably people who are in a me ridge with themselves for egocentric reasons, it's all about them, right? Um, these are people who are afraid of losing maybe their freedom, their individuality by uniting with another. And until they really learn how to fully unite with another person without losing themselves, until they get confident and their ability to set and maintain those healthy boundaries, um, they're gonna probably remain single or they're going to be in relationships where they never really fully unite with another person, which ends up creating a whole nother set of problems, which would probably be a whole nother video some other time. But uh, moving on, number three, subconscious programming. And this has a lot to do with childhood emotional neglect, CEN. It's something I talk about in my book where, you know, you grow up with these messages, whether it's directly explicitly said to you or not, 
you get the memo in some respect that you're not lovable, you're not wanted, you're not a priority, that you have to give in order to get, um, that you can't just openly express your needs and wants and values and have that honored, okay? So that instills a lot of insecurity within yourself and um, very common among codependents and empaths, by the way. And it just starts out in the early programming in life where we get programmed by our parents or our caregivers, um, programmed for self-protection rather than other connection. And even in the moments where we think we're connecting with others, we're doing it in a self-protective way like, well, I'm going to have to give to you because there's no way you would ever just give to me for, you know what I'm saying? You, you know, it's almost, um, I hate to say manipulation, but you're giving to get rather than being in a relationship with somebody who just wants to give to you unconditionally. You, you learn in this childhood programming that love is conditional and that really rigs your mind in adulthood when you're trying to date, you start thinking, well, who's going to want me or who's going to love me? And I guess I'm not good enough or you know what I'm saying? Or I've got to go do this over here to be good enough. And then even when you do that, you find out that you're never good enough for certain people. Why? Because it's not about you. It's actually about them. Again, another, another topic. Finally, uh, number four, the internal vows and perhaps karma, okay? Um, in the last five years that I've found myself single as a mother, I've been brought back to a remembrance of what might have been an internal vow that I set very early on in life without really even realizing it. Um, those of you who know my story from my book, know that my parents were divorced by the age of one and my mother was remarried by the age of three and that marriage involved a lot a lot a lot of god a lot i'm just going to sum it up like that just believe me when i say a lot of abuse physical sexual emotional abuse in that family and it wasn't just you know, who she married, it was her, his two sons, okay? And so because of that horrendous experience, it marked me very early on in life where I made this, almost this internal vow that so much as I could help it, my children would never have to deal with the step family situation like I had to deal with. And I remember, you know, as I was an early adult, you know, I was would date people, and if I ran into somebody who already had kids by somebody else, I wouldn't get involved with them because I'm like, oh, that family, <laughs> you know? And so, um, you know, and I remember um, talking, and then when I got married and had kids, you know, I just remember talking to uh, my, my husband at the time about that, how we were like, oh, that family, we don't want our kids around that kind of situation. You know, we always kind of looked down our nose about that um, because he also, he too had gone through some abuse from a step parent. And um, every time we'd see other people going through these kind of, you know, we're like, ah, oh, you know. So there was an internal vow there that my kids were not going to deal with step family situations. And guess what? They haven't because I've not met anybody. And so I will say like part of me wonders, well, is that because I made an internal vow within myself long ago that my kids who are still at home, um, my oldest is out. My middle one will be 18 in a couple months and my youngest one is 15, but you know, so three more years to go, but um, is it not an accident that I find myself in this situation where, you know, they've not had to deal with a step parent or step siblings because I made that internal vow within myself? And I will say on to the karma point that perhaps this was a lesson that I had to learn that helped me to get more compassion for my parents. I don't I'm not saying that I've come to a place of agreeing with them, okay? 
but given the life that I've lived that is in contrast to them, they quickly got on to the next, like that was their priority. It was relationship, like kids are just along for that wild ride. You know, we were baggage. <laughs> we're just getting in the way of their new life, you know, but um, they were all, they prioritized relationship over family. Um, you know, getting married, married, having the status and all of that over the family. And um, that has not been my approach. And now I see the downside of my, my choices. You know, now I've learned more compassion for why the pressures of single parenthood drive people to be in relationships and stay in relationships that are probably not good for them and are probably very damaging to their children. And again, I'm not saying that I agree with it, but I am getting, I've gotten from this experience more depth of understanding. It might've been part of my karma to develop more compassion for why they made the decisions they made. Not that I agree with it, right? Keeping all those things in mind, I, I think, it, you know, if you look at all the explanations I gave, you can see why. I just don't think the answer is very simple. When somebody asks a simple question, why are you still single? Well, the answer, you know, it's a simple question, but it doesn't have a simple answer. And, you know, there are people out there that will say, well, if you're single, it's because deep down you want to be single. Um, you don't really want to be in a relationship you're not ready to love. And it's just like, well, mm, I hate that people, and even last night I was listening to somebody else boo-hooing, um, you know, people who are single, like, what's your problem? Get over yourself, heal, move on, you know, but you don't know what that person's situation is. You know, you're sitting them, they're telling them to stop thinking so much of themselves, but maybe that's all they did for the last 20 years and it got them into a bunch of trouble and they do need to think about themselves right now. So I'm gonna leave you off with five ideas on how you can use your time as a single person to your advantage. The first idea is find out what your needs are really get clear with what are your needs in a relationship and then honor those needs. For example, sexually, financially, mentally. For example, you know, if I think about my needs in a relationship, I, I realize like, I, I'm a talker, you know, and I'm a thinker. And so I can't do stupid. I can't do, you know, I can't be partnered with people who don't talk, don't communicate, people who stonewall, shut down, <laughs> you know, um, and people who are exhausted at the idea of, you know, reading something or thinking about something like that's not going to be compatible for me. That's not going to meet my relational needs. Uh, I can't do broke. I certainly can't do habitually broke. You know, when I was younger, was more open to the idea of, you know, living off of, of love, even if it had me living under a bridge, but you know, been there, done that. And um, that's, that's, no, <laughs> we can't do that. No bueno, okay, that's that's not gonna work. And, and I've also started to see that somebody who is financially broke habitually, um, this is symptomatic of a deeper issue, self-worth issues, somebody who's refusing to, um, grow and it's not that i'm not compassionate believe me i that's a whole again a whole nother video where i go into talking about the compassion that i have for people's financial struggles but compassion aside at what point do you start leveling up and empowering yourself rather than use your victimhood as an excuse to stay stuck where you are financially and not you know come out of poverty and a poverty mindset, a lack consciousness. So I can't do it. I can't do that. Those are my needs. I need somebody, you know, who can meet those needs. And sexual chemistry, like, oh, hell no. If there's no natural sexual chemistry, um, it's just, it's not, it's not gonna happen. I mean, I, 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 you know, I've gotten stronger about this too. And, you know, I've had men ask me, well, why, 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 why can't we date? I mean, we get along so great. I mean, why? And I've had to tell them, because I don't know why men do this. They press you and press you and press you. Why? 
And I finally told him, I said, because I just don't feel fireworks when I'm around you. I just, I'm, I'm sorry. I just don't, I don't feel the chemistry. All right. And if you don't feel the chemistry, don't try to, you know, fake it, right? Don't try to force it. Don't try to cultivate. If it's not naturally there, you know, respect and honor that. But you got to first off know what those needs are, okay, and honor them. Second, find out what your values are and meet those as well, like your emotional and spiritual values. So, for example, like a lot of women, I value security and loyalty. And yes, looking for a man that has some level of mastery in his life, like maybe he did have a hard time financially when he got started, but damn it. He went out there and he learned, you know, how to uh, be the CFO of his life, chief financial officer, right? He learned how to save and invest and he learned how to grow money and he learned how to manage money, you know? Um, I'm looking for somebody who, you know, is the master of something in their life something as opposed to this the saying uh jack of all trades master of none i'm not looking for jack of all trades you got to figure out what those values are and then meet them um emotionally and spiritually and then if you you know you're dating you you need to um articulate those needs and values. And um, even if you're not dating, write it out, articulate it. And it, just doing that puts you, you know, way ahead of, of a lot of people. Um, I've heard it said that chemistry is really important initially when you meet someone and that has a lot to do with financial, mental, and physical chemistry, okay? Um, but over the long term, if you really want a relationship to last, there's got to be compatibility on an emotional and spiritual level. So, you know, that's worth waiting for. If you can get all five of the, those components, really important. But if you can't even communicate what those components are, like what, what would be compatible for you emotionally and spiritually? What does, you know, set off the fireworks for you? physically, financially, and mentally, okay? If you can't even communicate that within yourself, you can't communicate it to another, you know, what those needs and values are. And unfortunately, a lot of people can't. This is why we're like fumbling in the dark, you know? Um, so be the exception to the rule. Be the rare person who actually can clearly communicate to yourself and to another what your needs and values are do that work and that's really going to set you apart um the fourth idea is to consider how you can come into greater alignment with companionship so can you make more time for dating socializing meeting new people i mean i've been scaling back my work so that I'm not constantly in my room hammering out content, okay? I'm trying to free up my schedule and I'm trying to remain mindful that if somebody invites me to go somewhere, go, get out of the room, get out and meet people, you know? And it's not that I'm expecting to really meet the one or anything, it's just like I'm putting myself out there so that if the fates were to bless me, then I'm able to get blessed, you know what I'm saying? Um, another, another thing you can do to come into alignment with companionship is just drop the need to be with someone perfect. And this is something I've realized. I mean, there have been these little things going around online about, right, you're perfect. What are you all this, you know, and I kind of did just say that now, didn't I? But your wish list for who would Mr. Perfect be, okay? Oh my gosh, I did that like five years ago after my divorce. And I still haven't met that person. And my thinking has evolved since then um, where I'm realizing it's really not about that, okay? Um, it's about you uniting yourself with somebody who is willing to partner with you in life as you're willing to partner with them in healing one another and working through traumas together 
by being authentic and acknowledging your flaws, not hiding, denying, suppressing, not putting up this, I'm gonna win the girl by convincing her that I'm someone I'm not, you know what I'm saying? Or vice versa, I'm gonna win the guy by making him think I'm someone I'm not, you know? This is just really being in a, in a real relationship where you have two imperfect, flawed people who are openly acknowledging this and they're coming together to do that healing work together. And I'm not talking about lip service. I'm talking about really doing the, the, the healing together. That's, I think, worth exchanging this idea of perfection for getting a partner who is interested in perfecting the partnership rather than coming there perfect, supposedly. <laughs> okay, um, finally, Protect, guard, transmute your sexual energy. Kind of talked about this before where, you know, you are putting your sexual energy into worthwhile opportunities, um, creative, passionate projects. Um, because you're getting to this point where you realize, hey, listen, if this person is not here to um, help me evolve with my life, then they're a distraction. Um, I heard Ralph Smart say that, by the way. Um, very, very awesome uh, with the Infinite Waters uh, here on YouTube. He said, if you're not helping me to evolve, you're a distraction. Spot on. Absolutely. Um, people want to progress in life. They want to have a life partner. They want to build something. And if they don't, then I'd be concerned, okay? Because this is a person who lacks meaning and purpose in their life. They're drifters, they're aimless. And unfortunately, those people are prone to a lot of addictions, uh, really toxic behavior because they're always chasing after the next thrill or the next high. You don't wanna be a part of that. Um, you, you're never able to sit back and enjoy the fruits of your labor because it's always being squandered by this person who's sabotaging it, running after their next thrill or high. Um, definitely, um, when you take on this attitude of, you know, you're either helping me to evolve or you're a distraction, it really simplifies things. It really simplifies who you're giving your attention to. And ladies, you gotta realize there's a lot of men who are lonely and they want a woman who's gonna listen to them. Oh, I've experienced this. But they have absolutely no intention or no ability to invest in to that woman what she deserves and what she needs and what she values. And that makes them a waste of time. And I'm sorry to say that because it sounds really cruel and you wanna be nice and oh, well, woe is you and I understand and you know we want to be the healers and the comforters and all of that but when you realize that these are men again who are very self egocentric make me feel good make me happy give me attention give me admiration but there's no exchange of value to you they are wasting you are your time they are a distraction you have to cut these people out of your life you might love them, you might care for them, but they are not going to advance you. They are going to hold you back. Get them out of your life, as painful as that might be. Now, in closing, I'm going to say, you know, again, we started off with a simple question. Why, why are you still single? But there's a not so simple answer. And hopefully through me explaining all of this, Hopefully I've said something here that is helping you to define more clearly uh, what the answer is uniquely in your life. And hopefully the ideas that I've given you are gonna help you to refine your spirit, your soul in this life experience so that you can get the most out of the single life. Wishing you the best, be blessed.